Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Massachusetts Safer to School Spring Webinar, New Tools for Schools. My name is Diane Hansen, and I'm the director of our statewide program. Before we begin, I do want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be closed captioned and made available on our website within the next few weeks. Our colleague Drew is here for tech support, so please use the chat function if you need help. Here uh, to the right are some quick tips for using WebEx. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse hover over here, but up on the top right are the uh, participants drop down, so you can use that and check out the participants. We have chat here in the middle, and this is for um, any technical difficulties or questions directly to the host or the presenter. Um, we are also going to be dropping in some useful links in the chat throughout the webinar, so that's where you'll find those links. And then at the bottom right is the Q&A window. Please use the Q&A for any questions about Safe Routes to School or about the presentation. At the bottom here, you can zoom in or zoom out with the magnifying glass. So um, WebEx may be a new tool for some of you, so we just wanted to give you some of those quick tips there. And now let's move on to the agenda. So today we're going to use the six E's of Safe Routes to School to guide us through the resources we developed this school year. We will follow that up with our upcoming events for the remainder of the school year and then leave about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Each of our resources will have an index containing the format of the materials, the available languages, the intended audience, and where to find the resource. The downloadable PDF of this presentation also has active links to, that go directly to the resources. And throughout the presentation, Drew will be dropping that link into the chat. So for folks who join a little bit later, that'll be available to them as well. And we're also sending it out in an email afterwards. But first, let's do some team introductions. So um, today you'll be hearing from everyone on our team as they present in a tool that they specifically worked on for the program. We also have a new team member of our team. We also have a new member of our team, Lucy Friedman Bell, who is currently coordinating partner activities in the light blue territory. If you can see, she's waving. We told her to wave. Um, she's in the light blue territory between Pat and Rachel. And we're thrilled to have Lucy join our dynamic team as she brings a lot of energy and passion to our Safe Routes to School mission. And now I'm going to have each presenter introduce themselves before we begin. It'll give them a chance to take themselves off mute and say hi. So we're going to start with Pat over in the western part of the state. Pat? Hi, everybody. Good uh, Good afternoon, I should say. Uh, Diane introduced myself. I'm really excited to see some people on the call today. And uh, hope you, hopefully you'll leave today learning something new about our program. Great. Thanks, Pat. I have Lucy next. Hi everyone, I'm Lucy. Uh, I'm the coordinator for the Connecticut River Valley and Western Worcester County. Um, and I just joined the Safe Roots to School team in March of this year. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Great, thanks Lucy. Rachel? Good afternoon, I'm Rachel O'Donnell and I've been with Safe Roots for about two and a half years and I cover the Metro West section as well as parts of Central. So I'm the dark blue section. Great, thanks Rachel. Judy? Welcome everyone and happy early April vacation. Um, Judy Clocker here and I serve the communities of Northeast Massachusetts. Thanks Judy. Vivian? Hello, I'm Vivian and I cover the yellow region on the map, which is the greater Boston area as well as the South Shore. Welcome everyone. Excellent. Emily? Hi everyone, I'm Emily. I've been with Safe Roots for over five years now, so nice to see a lot of familiar faces. I cover the light green territory, so the Cape and Islands, the South Coast, as well as Amesbury, Salisbury, and Merrimack up on the North Shore. And also, you, you see me around at a lot of the statewide meetings that happen throughout the state. Thanks, Emily. And Leon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Leon Papadopoulos. I am the Senior Operations Manager for the program, and I've been with Safe Roots since 2005. Great, thank you, Leon. And Leon's going to be pasting some links in the chat throughout the presentation as well. So thank you. 
Let's uh, move on to our first set of tools, which are our education resources. And our first presenter is Vivian Ortiz. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you, Diane. When I joined this team two years ago, I was, I've been really proud since joining of how much effort we're continuously putting into making our resources and programs available to as many students as possible across the Commonwealth. One of those areas has to do with language. Our parent guardian travel survey is available in nine languages. And this year we started providing flyers for our flagship days in English, Haitian Creole and Portuguese. We've also created many of our COVID related documents in multiple languages. A few years ago, our team put together an animated bike safety video for schools to use in place of, or in addition to an in-person bike safety assembly. I'm really excited to share that the video is now available in Spanish and like the English language version, captions are now included. We're now going to show you just a little clip of the video. Hola alumnos, me llamo Diana y trabajo en el programa de rutas escolares seguras de Massachusetts. Me emociona que estén aquí para aprender de bicicletas y cómo estar seguros al andar en nuestras bicis a la escuela o en nuestro vecindario. Hablaremos de lo básico de las bicicletas, tomar decisiones inteligentes al andar en bici y algunas reglas de tránsito para nuestra seguridad. Primero, miremos un video sobre algunas razones para andar en bicicleta. Hoy hablaremos de las bicicletas y de cómo estar seguros cuando andamos en ellas. ¿Cuáles son algunas razones por las que andamos en bici? Because no two schools are the same, each requires a tailored transportation plan reflective of the needs of their student population. Consideration is given to geography, travel patterns, access, and equity. The Massachusetts Safe Routes to School program brings 15 years of solution-driven services to support partner schools and positively impact active student transportation. Given current, given current events, Safe Routes developed an innovative guide to support schools grappling with their transportation planning for hybrid and full return to in-person learning. Changes to pre-COVID student transportation modes were expected to yield an increase in vehicle traffic and or an increase in walking, biking, and rolling for your school. The tip sheet, Safe School Travel During COVID, identifies measures that schools can address when developing arrival and dismissal planning. And now I'd like to pass the presentation to my colleague, Judy, who will start with the webinars we produced this year. Thank you, Vivian. As part of our ongoing adult education series, last August, Safe Roots hosted a webinar centered on this tip sheet and specific ways in which Safe Roots programming can be targeted to help school administrators manage COVID transportation related changes. The discussion reviewed the best practices the program uses in developing effective planning for safe arrival dismissal for all forms of student transportation, improving safety and anticipation of increased family vehicle traffic and tips for reducing it, as well as options for educators to complete active transportation and safety training. Also featured in this webinar is a spotlight of the Department of Environmental Protection's The Green Team and an overview of MassDOT's very successful Shared Streets and Spaces grant program. This grant had four components, one of which included criteria for creating safer walking and biking networks. All Safe Routes webinar recordings are available on the web website for Safe Routes and are closed captioned. The Safe Routes Fall Summit is an annual in-depth workshop that provides an overview of the program. It is an appropriate learning experience for municipal as well as school-based personnel and volunteers. We discuss who we are, explain what we offer, and why the program is so important to a student's safety and well-being. Being held remotely, we omitted the interactive mapping exercises and dismissal observation and substituted our networking lunch for a walk break and social media challenge. Congrats again to those who won some fun gift certificates. This year, our focus centered on the mechanics of getting students to and from school. We reviewed walk audits, which examined the neighborhood students traverse when traveling from home to school, as well as arrival and dismissal observations. Specifically, how your school's property circulation plan is used for all modes of transportation. 
To add some interesting spice to this year's virtually held event, we included a demystifying segment on biking gear and a series of quick tips on dressing to be seen, bike baskets, helmet decorating, and fun footwear. The second in our series of informational webinars focuses on municipalities, specifically the shift from engagement from enforcement to engagement. To be sensitive to some of the social unrest events of the past year, many within the public health realm have re-examined this terminology. Police, school resource officers, and crossing guards are an integral part of the Safe Routes family. As such, we took the opportunity to showcase these important stakeholders and how we work together in keeping our students safe. It's important to note that Safe Routes is not a stay in your lane program. We work collaboratively with a community-wide approach to bridge the gap between transportation and health. We include stakeholders from our schools, municipalities, and the community. The webinar content was designed for municipal staff, including those involved with transportation or mobility, public works, planning, and public health, as well as Safe Routes task members, Safe Routes Alliance partners, and anyone interested in learning more about the whole community approach to Safe Routes. Special guest speakers included a police officer and a community pedestrian bicycle committee. How does your student, student begin their school day? No matter how your student travels from home to school to home, Safe Routes wants both students and staff to be safe. Student safety during arrival dismissal is a school priority. This new tip sheet outlines basic safety guidelines so that your students and their families can do their part to create a worry-free travel environment on and around school grounds. Like many Safe Routes document, this tip sheet is available in nine languages in order to make our safety tips more accessible to Massachusetts residents. Studies show that students who walk and bike to school boost their self-esteem, resiliency, and sense of independence. Having our student commuters arrive and depart school with confidence depends on following these, five, these eight simple steps. Use sidewalks and walk facing traffic, only cross at intersections and crosswalks, never mid-block or between parked cars. Follow crossing guard instructions. Ride your bike or scooter with traffic on the right side of the road. Remember, everything with wheels goes in the same direction. Follow our traffic signals and signs. Know your local biking routes and bike rack locations. No trees, please. School bus lanes are for school buses only, no exceptions. And for everyone's safety, be aware of school zones and obey their 20 mile an hour speed limits. The document also includes three set subheadings of safety tips, including why not try something new? With every new season, why not create a new routine? Consider walking, biking, and rolling to and from school with your student. Walking and biking has been shown to have a positive effect on attendance, physical and mental health, and traffic congestion in our school zones. Two, Safe Routes recommends getting to school safely with three basic activities, walking school bus and bike trains, park, walk, and roll, and walking Wednesdays with our flagship events. Lastly, we did a deep dive into common sense ways to make walking, biking, and family vehicle use safer for all. Let's review the driving tips and school zones we use as an example. Remember, most elementary students are shorter than the height of the average SUV's hood. Give priority to pedestrians and cyclists. Drive at a walking pace as you approach the school. As a driver, follow crossing guard instructions. Crossing guards can pause traffic, but not direct it. Only load and unload in designated drop off and pickup areas. Turn off your engine while waiting and place your vehicle in park. Students should only exit and enter on a vehicle's right passenger side. And do not queue on public roadways. Lastly, we made some fun bookmarks that include some of these quick tips for our students. These are available through your outreach coordinator for all walking and biking events. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Pat, who will introduce our newest publication, which falls under education and engineering. Thanks for the great overview, Judy. I'm now really excited to officially unveil our pop-up projects for SRTS guidebook. In response to the past year, many of your communities, and even some of you on this call, 
implemented temporary active living measures such as pop-up bike lanes or outdoor dining. As many communities look to do it again, we created a guide that specifically reviews school-based options for you and your community. The book lists a variety of types, provides some cost references, and features examples from the Commonwealth and beyond. One note, you'll see that we refer to these as pop-up projects. Other publications call it tactical urbanism, and while we use the less intimidating phrase pop-up, they are virtually the same thing. This slide features a pop-up project that is a staff favorite, particularly Judy. On the screen, you're looking at a 3D crosswalk at Roberts Elementary School in Medford. Two elementary school students came up with the idea for a 3D crosswalk as a low-cost solution to slow traffic outside their school. The innovative design required special approval from the city's mayor and traffic commission and has since been replicated at several other elementary schools in Medford. This is just one design of many different crosswalk options, and this guide has a lot more than just painting lines. In addition to elements like painting crosswalks, there are other recommendations, such as using a few cones to increase the space for students and other members of the community to walk, bike, or roll. One use of cones to achieve that is a shared street, like this one in Somerville. Community members were able to work together to allocate additional recreation space in a central business district. Note, while this took place in an urban environment, many of Western Massachusetts towns could also use this in their downtown area. If your school isn't in a central business area, no worries. Using cones is a great option for suburban and rural schools as they can extend or make a sidewalk where one previously did not exist. Give them a try during your next flagship day. Our next set of tools are for equity, encouragement, and engagement. I want to introduce my colleague, Rachel, who will take us through our latest equity tool. Great. Thanks, Pat. The Safe Routes to School program prioritizes safe, active, and healthy opportunities for public elementary and middle school students, regardless of ability, socioeconomic status, race, or culture. Therefore, we wanted to create a document that exemplifies tangible strategies to incorporate equity into the other five E's. Under the equity section of the website, you will naturally find this document titled Equity Strategies for Schools. Each of the other E's are broken down into a beginner level, intermediate level, and advanced level. That way, both new and mature Safe Roots programs across the Commonwealth have something to strive toward. For example, it's great that an elementary school wants to incorporate our pedestrian safety curriculum into their PE class. Eventually, to be more equitable across the entire district, we would recommend that all elementary schools in that district do the same. One thing that we really wanted to stress in this document was the difference between equality and equity. The best way we thought to do that was through an original graphic to help illustrate the importance of equity. That is why it is in the front and center of the first page of the document. On the left, all students are given the same pair of shoes. That pair might be too big, too small, or not work for a specific activity. This is not the approach that we want when it comes to safe routes. On the right, however, all the students have a pair of shoes that are fitted to them and their specific needs. Safe routes is not a one size fits all program and each community has different needs. With this document, schools and districts will have a better sense of direction when it comes to growing their own Safe Roots programs. Another example would be under the encouragement section. A great way to introduce Safe Roots into a community is for a district to, to participate in our three flagship events in October, February, and May. Once a community is more comfortable with walking, biking, and rolling to school, a great next step would be to have a monthly walk, bike, and roll to school day. If that monthly event then turned into a weekly or even daily event, that would certainly be considered advanced. Safe routes can help with the creation of route maps to help guide students along on their way to school. The map you see here is an example of a walking school bus route that Safe routes can create for your community. After the remaining E's are discussed, we then recommend adding Safe routes to your local wellness and or transportation policy. Not only does this codify Safe routes across a, across a district, it helps to sustain it. I would like to note that all of the E's across this document are hyperlinked, so by clicking on one, it'll take you to that specific page on our website if you would like to learn more. Our most recently added event was our first ever Crossing Guard Appreciation Day on March 24th. Crossing Guards are a constant presence throughout the school year. 
They are a friendly face to greet you in the morning and send you off in the afternoon. They are out there rain or shine, heat or bitter cold, and even during a pandemic. More students have been walking and biking, and there are more cars on the road, so we wanted to acknowledge the importance of crossing guards now more than ever. We were so excited to see all of the outpour of support and appreciation that crossing guards received from their local communities. People also had the chance to nominate their crossing guard for our first ever crossing guard of the year award, and that will be presented at our end of the year award ceremony on June 2nd. Our team has been reading the submissions and let me tell you, it has been so difficult narrowing down the list because all of these crossing guards are amazing in their own way and deserve to be recognized. Now I will pass things over to Lucy to talk about a current contest going on right now. Thanks, Rachel. I'm excited to talk about our yard sign design contest. So the contest is a great opportunity for students to engage creatively with bike and pedestrian safety topics. This is the fifth year of the contest. This year's topic is be safe and be seen. So students' designs are focused on wearing bright and reflect reflective clothing, wearing helmets, using crosswalks, and or being aware of traffic, especially in and around school zones. We extended the contest deadline this year to April 16th, so your students have two more days to submit their designs. Up to four winners will be selected and announced in May. Each winner will have one side of a yard sign, so there will be two designs per sign. We typically produce two different signs each year, showcasing four designs in total. We do have extras left over from previous years, and we just reordered our anti-idling signs from 2019, which were very popular. Please reach out to your outreach coordinator to deliver some to your school. The signs come with metal stands, so that you can place them in the grass or dirt. Next, I'd like to pass it along to my colleague, Emily, who will cover three tip sheets we developed this year. Awesome, thank you, Lucy. The next resource we are going to discuss is our Why Walk, Bike, and Roll tip sheet. This tip sheet provides ideas and activities your school community can use to encourage more walking, biking, and rolling to school. Some examples of fun encouragement programs we discussed in this tip sheet include walking school buses, bike trains, special walk, bike, and roll to school days, park walk and roll programs, as well as summer sessions. Safe Routes to School has free online resources, including a full toolkit with all Safe Routes program offerings, as well as virtual and in-person assistance to help you organize programs for walking and biking. A park walk and roll is a safer to school activity that enables students and parents and guardians to park at a designated location between a quarter and a half mile from school and walk the rest of the way. This program is beneficial for families who live too far from the school to walk or bike. Since they would otherwise drive their students to school, a park walk and roll program helps reduce congestion in the school zone area. This is a great way to involve families before and after school and to foster a sense of community while practice safe walking, biking, and rolling habits. This tip sheet shows how to identify a location as well as how to organize a park walk and roll. Safers at School can help design a park walk and roll program that best fits your school's unique needs as you develop health, safety, and sustainable transportation policies and programs. A Safer to School Task Force can streamline student transportation planning and help troubleshoot school and family concerns by enlisting the expertise of school district, municipal, and family stakeholders. These task forces are often hosted by an individual school or at a district level. A Safer to School Task Force can assist with bringing together key stakeholders to help work on the Safer to School aspects that most impact their particular community. This tip sheet provides a framework for how to start a task force at your school and or community. And now I will pass the webinar back to Diane, who will walk us through our engineering resources. Thank you, Emily. Let me just make sure I have everything up. So I wanted to talk about our Signs and Lines program, which continues to be a success and supports schools and municipalities towards safer walking, biking, and rolling. The intention of the program is to reimburse municipalities up to $6,000 to cover signage and pavement markings around partner elementary and middle schools. 
This grant also includes planner and traffic engineer time to prepare drawings and cost estimates. There is a, this is considered a quick build project and therefore all improvements must be completed by June 30th of the current year in order to receive the reimbursement. This was the third year of the Signs and Lines program. In 2019, we did one pilot project in Lawrence and in 2020, we selected our first five projects. This year, Chelsea, Nahant, North Adams, uh, Seekonk, and Salem were the grant recipients. The image on the left is an example of the observations taken during the needs assessment where our traffic engineer, transportation planner, outreach coordinator, and school administrators will observe an arrival and dismissal and walk the area surrounding the school. The team then prepares a needs assessment memo and presents the observations and recommendations to the municipality and the school. Based on the recommendations, our traffic engineer presents a set of drawings outlined in the location, outlining the location of the proposed signage and pavement markings. You can see here that we also show the type of crosswalk, which in this case is a ladder style with thermoplastic paint. Along with the drawings, the engineer prepares a cost estimate of the improvements and a bid sheet to help the municipality bid out the work to external subcontractors. The municipality can also choose to do the work internally using their own staff or on call contractors. Here's an example of some before and after um, work completed in Holliston last year. The photo on the left shows no connectivity from the Upper Charles Rail Trail just to the left of the oil truck. Before the project, there was no connectivity for students to use the trail and cross the street to access the three school complex on the right. The photo on the right shows the new high visibility crosswalk and flashing crosswalk sign. This project also includes many more school zone signs and crosswalk signs on and off campus. The town contributed additional funds to create a walking path from the edge of the crosswalk to the rail trail. And the oil business was happy to have a safer crossing for pedestrians who previously cut through their lot to access the trail and the school. And now let's transition to our evaluation tools. Next, I wanna talk about our annual partner survey. This is the third year of the survey and we rely heavily on your feedback to guide our programming moving forward. This survey is open to all contacts in our school partner and stakeholder mailing list and we have 60 responses so far, but I definitely want 60 more. So I am encouraging you to please click the link in the chat that Leon's putting in there and make sure you fill that out. Um, not now, because I want you to listen to the webinar, but as soon as we get off the webinar, definitely take some time to fill that out. Respondents are entered to win one of four $50 Amazon gift cards and some really cool Safe Routes to School prize packs for your school. So some of the objectives of our survey are to understand how schools are using the program and what their perceptions of the program are. Uh, we want to have you assess the value of specific content, resources and materials provided by us, identify any changes in behavior associated with the program like improved safety and increased walking and biking, and also to assess interest in future programs and services, including post COVID support. One of the questions we asked this year is about how you'd like us to, how do you like to receive updates, notifications, or materials from us? So please take the time to let us know. We are anxiously waiting to see how the responses differ between this year and last due to COVID. So we're keeping the survey open for just a few more days. I think uh, Friday we're closing that. And Leon, um, if he hasn't already, is posting that in the chat for all of you to fill out. I did want to share some preliminary data from the survey. And um, you can see right now the majority of our content is accessed through our website. Um, also, 83% of our respondents uh, qualified that they were in a hybrid mode for um, this last school year. And lastly, school district staff represents the highest percentage of respondents. So let's continue to get new responses from everyone. And now I'd like to pass my presentation along to my colleague, Pat, to talk about our new program dashboard, which is another evaluation tool. Thanks, Diane. Our final new tool is the SRTS dashboard. We're really excited to announce this new resource for SRTS partner schools 
parents and guardians, and other SRTS stakeholders. We are so proud of our partner schools for their work and dedication to the SRTS program. The new dashboard is a great way to follow your school's engagement within the SRTS program. You can see your school's activities, event participation, information on parent and guardian surveys, arrival and dismissal observations, and more. The SRTS dashboard is another step in keeping a foundation of equity and transparency as we provide support to students and schools across the Commonwealth. While there are many different uses for this tool, one of the easiest uses will be for your SRTS grant applications. When writing the application, this site can help you or someone in a different department quickly understand your school's role in SRTS. Data is currently updated every few months that we are looking into making it live sometime later this year. You can access this dashboard on our evaluation tab of our website. And while we're here, we're gonna do a quick example. So Diane, would you mind just opening the dashboard and selecting a community from the drop-down list? Yes, let's make that happen. Okay. And while so, Diane is bringing it up, um, I just want to emphasize again that if you haven't filled out our partner survey, please do. Um, I know it makes my job a lot easier knowing how I can best communicate and uh, serve your communities. So I think. Pat. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, can you see the live dashboard? Oh, yes. Now? Sorry. I thought that was a slide. Um, <laughs> so, Diane, why don't you go ahead and pick a random community? I am going to go with Arlington. Oh, nice. Arlington, one of our oldest Safe Bruce to School partners. So, as you can see on the left side, Diane has selected Arlington in the filters column, and you can filter a bunch of different ways, whether you're doing a city or a town, a specific coordinator. Moving one uh, way to the right in the schools column there, this lists all the different schools that are partners with Safe Fruits to School in the town of Arlington. And as Diane's scrolling down, it shows all the different ones. Moving a little bit further to the right, where we see our map, yeah, exactly. Diane has clicked a specific school, which the map has now focused in on the specific partner school we have. Uh, so in this case, it's a uh, Cyrus Dolan Elementary School. And this will show where in the community is. And if you click the point, it'll give you some basic information like the address and the date a partner joined. Moving down we, in our actions and events area, where you see the bar graph, this is one visual representation of some of the different actions that uh, this specific school has taken in the past year. And similarly, if we look at our events bar or events pie chart, this also gives you a visual representation of what the school has done in the past year. Um, moving to the right in activities, this also lists some of the more recent things that we've done. So for example, Judy recently in December made a, uh, looks like a student address map or a walking school bus map. So great to see that the students at this school are gonna be doing that. Um, so this is a great tool where if you're not sure what you want to do, or if you're trying to learn about your school's involvement, this is a great spot. Um, one thing we want to mention is while this might give an example where this school did an arrival dismissal observation on the 4th, in order for an individual to actually access the report, that's the observation, they still need to formally request that from the school who will then request it from us. So this merely is just stating what's gone on. If someone wants specifics, they go through the traditional communication channels. So, with that in mind, I think I'm now going to pass it over to Lucy, who's going to talk about some of our upcoming events. Thanks, Pat. Massachusetts Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day is coming up on May 5th. Your school can also celebrate this day on any day in May that works best for you. Um, make sure to register your school ahead of time and request incentive items, including bookmarks in English and Spanish and stickers with different designs. Registration information can be found on the main page of our website under events. Our annual award ceremony is coming up on June 2nd, so be sure to save the date and plan for a start time of around 10 o'clock a.m. As we get closer to the date, please keep a lookout for your invite to the ceremony and be sure to register. We're looking forward to seeing everyone there. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, that is it for us. We are actually gonna go into the Q&A right now. And I think I have, I haven't been looking in the chat or the Q&A, but Vivian, I believe you're gonna help lead us through that. Is that right? We don't have, we don't have any questions yet. <laughs> 
My goodness, with all the tools we we just created this year, I was hoping we'd have um, a few. So don't be shy. You can even, if you want, you can post anonymously in the chat and we'll ask the question, or you can even take yourself off mute and um, ask a question live if you'd like. Otherwise, if we don't see any questions come in within the next minute or so, we can go on to, uh, we do have a few more slides after this, but I do want to give anyone an opportunity to ask a question. I guess we did such a good job presenting everything that it was crystal clear and <laughs> nobody needed any additional information. Um, oh, thanks, Phil. <laughs> Phil's in the chat. Hi, Phil. Feel like it's Facebook Live when it was like, hi, nice to see you all. Um, I am going to go on to the next slide so that we can wait for some other questions to come in if we have any. But I do want to send a reminder to everyone that Safe Roots, the Safe Roots program operates year round. During the summer, we're working with schools and districts to help with active transportation planning, professional development sessions, updating arrival dismissal procedures, and conducting summer bike and ped safety sessions for summer programs. Please don't forget to keep in touch with your outreach coordinator and schedule a planning meeting to discuss back to school transportation. I know it seems silly to think about the summer. We are um, going into spring vacation week, but you know, we're planners here. So we like to think long term and we don't we want to make sure you don't forget about us. So um, on to the next. So if you have don't already have us liked on Facebook, liked on Twitter, um, following us on Instagram or LinkedIn, please do. When you download the presentation, the PDF presentation, all these links are live. They'll take you to um, uh, directly to that social media site. And um, I do see that we have, Vivian, I'll uh, let you bring that up. It looks like we do have a question. Um, and I also want to say that Leon has pasted a link uh, for our webinar evaluation. So that's the 30 second eval that says, how did we do for this webinar? So we definitely want you to fill that in as well. But let's go to, we have one in the chat and one in the Q&A. So Vivian, go ahead. I'm going to go with Todd's question first. Um, he's asking with the 3D crosswalks in Medford, do we know if they have heard from FHWA? which has been contacting other municipalities and instructing them not to install or remove them. So, Judy, you have met um, uh, Medford, Medford, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so specifically, I cannot answer that question. However, I have been told by the town engineer that um, these were only have only been installed on um, secondary roads would directly border the school or school driveway um, enter um, egress points. So I can't specifically answer, but that is what I know. And in our pop up guide for um, temporary projects and safe routes, we address some of the um, some of those issues are sort of sticky wickets, I guess, for um, for the METCD and um, and we really do let everyone know that they need to contact their local traffic commission and and stick within guidelines. But we give you some resources to address that. But that is a great question. And I think it's something that a lot of municipalities are dealing with as they try to get really creative with um, traffic calming measures. So, um, okay, next one, Vivian. You mentioned that there was something in the chat, but I don't see a question in the chat. I only see the the, the link. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 It kind of runs into the information right above that. Okay. So from Kay O'Dwyer, um, do you have a resource that helps community members best make the case to municipal and school leadership? So, hmm. so many, I'm trying to think of what, yeah. <laughs> what, what would be best to narrow it down? Um, somebody help me. I'd probably start with the toolkit, maybe. Um, it lists all of the resources for the program. Um, we also have a policy document, and that's coming to mind. It's something that we developed last year, and it really talks about how a school, a district, a municipality, and the state all can contribute to help 
bringing safe routes to school into their um, into their programs. So I maybe would say the policy document and that is on our equity page. Um, so take a look at that and if somebody can grab that from the chat, maybe paste the link for that in there. And Judy's ready to add a little bit more. Oh, great. Judy, please. Um, Kate, thank you for your question. Good, so good that you're on the line. Um, another point might be um, communication. It's all about having the right hand, the left hand know what each other is doing. Again, I think it's been mentioned a few times um, today. Safe Roots is not a stay in your lane program. So we want the school administration to be in conversation with the community. It might be your local bed pipe, uh, bed uh, pedestrian bicycle group. It might be your local traffic advisory group. Um, et cetera, to be talking with the municipality. So basically we need everyone in the room talking together. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And I'm, I want to just add the importance of establishing those task forces. So that is a way for community members to let um, the municipal and school leadership that perhaps right now are overwhelmed and saying, you know, if you go to them and I, you, I went to this great webinar and I want to do this in our program, Folks need to step up and say, we're here to help you. This is not one other thing that we're wanting to add to your very, very full plate. So, you know, coming to them and saying, we want this to be something that our community is going to be taking on and we want to help you out. So we do have a document that does specifically talk about the formation of um, task forces. So we can also put that here in the chat. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Vivian. Do you see the next one from uh, Phil asking about an inventory of pop up projects? I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, they're coming in on both sides. Sorry. So, I can, uh, I can start with the pop up projects inventory question, Diane. Um, okay, great. So, in developing this guide, we don't have a comprehensive list of pop up projects that have taken place across the Commonwealth. I think. One of the great things that many communities have shown last year is they all took it on in different ways. But what I would say is within that guide, there's got to be at least six or seven examples within that guide. And I think beyond that, a great way to do it is get in touch with your outreach coordinator. I know if anyone from Western Mass has questions or wants examples, I'm happy to research that. So I think as far as a comprehensive list goes, we don't have one of those, but the guides, there's many examples peppered throughout the guide. I can add an example. Um, Emily and I were actually down in Seekonk last week, and there wasn't a sidewalk that connects um, part of the school grounds with the sidewalk on the adjacent street. So what they did was they painted hash marks on the ground about the same width as a sidewalk, and then they also um, lined it with a set of cones and rope. So it really showed um, it's like a temporary sidewalk, but it really is a very obvious um, walking location so cars are aware that students will be walking during that zone um, so we thought that was really nice to see on their school campus thanks rachel and laura i see that um vivian also i think responded um, about the question presenting at regional planning. And I think we also, um, not to put Derek on the spot for MassDoc, but it's one of the things that we're um, looking at doing is actually um, presenting whenever um, a grant comes out is uh, letting the uh, regional planning agencies know, but a lot of them are on our mailing list. And so I think actually all of them are, so they do get our regular updates. Um, and I guess I'll go into signs and lines for uh, timing. Timing of signs and lines um, in a regular non-pandemic year would be um, introduction of the program or the application sometime in the fall with awards being given in late fall on the start of the winter and then um, planning and assessments begin in winter with work being done in the spring. And it all happens in one project year or in one, I should say, um, state fiscal year. Vivian, do we have more questions? Oh, sorry. There is one other question that Daniel asked about um, if the dashboard provides the information about the task forces in the communities. And 
It does not, but if you want to reach out to the outreach coordinator in your area to find out about the existing task forces that are there, and then that person can also let you know if there are others within um, the, the other ones that are in the Commonwealth, if you're interested in that, but they're not included in the dashboard as of yet, because it's there's information one, related to the schools that's on there, right? There's one qualification to that, Vivian. You're, you're right in general. The There might be an instance where in the event that a specific school forms a task force and in the event that the outreach coordinator marks it internally on their side that a task force has been formed at that school, it could show up uh, on that. For example, I'm working with a task force in one community out in Western Mass and in the event that they form one, if I assign it to that school on our internal records, it should show up in the dashboard uh, externally facing. But I think the best way to go about it is to reach out to your outreach coordinator if you have a question about a specific school, because in addition to telling you whether one exists, they can possibly give you some additional information about said uh, task force group. Thank you, Beth. Okay, I'm looking to see if we have any anything else that came up. I see that there were some comment, um, some comments that were sent about, let's see, about the school flyer. And um, David, uh, you know, we'll get back to you on those. I want to, there's a, a lot to read in here, so we'll address those um, separately if we can with you. Um, let's see here, I see another one coming in. Oh, Vivian, I'll let you read this big one. I have the box that says select a question. I can't scroll down to see uh, okay. questions for what All right. No worries. Here in Bedford, we've experienced a higher than usual volume of single car, single trip car drop-offs and pickups, creating a significant traffic increase and conflict with kids walking and rolling to school. Some families are opting out of putting kids on buses due to COVID. Has this been the experience of most suburban districts? We've been, we've, we're, um, we've thought about posting signs that say, if your kids bike or walk, you'd be at work by now. But in these times, you can't judge people for their choice. Any creative ideas? Um, I think of all of our outreach coordinators could raise their hands right now and say, yes, that is the experience. Um, so if you, a few of you folks want to um, chime in and, and let, <laughs> let everyone know that you've been getting calls right and left about this. Yes. <laughs> For sure, and that's definitely where our park walk and roll document comes into play because at least it broadens the congestion radius around the school ground. So even if they can't walk or bike from their home to their school, you know, they can at least bar a bike or walk the remaining um, like way to the school door. So it just helps alleviate all that congestion around the school grounds. Yeah. And to piggyback on what Rachel just said, um, Part of our education, besides being directed towards, say, professional development or to the students themselves, is all for the parents. So we do have uh, driver safety tip sheets um, for driving in school zones, and um, we do try to educate parents that parent traffic, you are not in traffic, you are the traffic. So um, it does take a village, and they're part of the equation. We want everyone, no matter how you get to school, to be safe. So. It's a broader conversation, and it's an also an unintended consequence of COVID. I think one thing I would add with the park, walk, and roll option, um, this might apply specifically for some of our suburban and rural communities. That doesn't necessarily, like, while a park, walk, and roll is great when one gets dropped off in the community and walks from a central business district to the school, another great opportunity is if you have a large campus-style setting, where maybe your middle school, your elementary school, and your high school all are on a single parcel. Um, sometimes a park walk and roll, especially in the afternoon, is as simple as having your elementary school, school students walk from the elementary school to the unused parking lot on the high school side of the property. And so I think, especially uh, since Mark mentioned it in a suburb, suburban uh, element, that could be something that your community explores too, is um, it's not always walking bar, it might just be walking to a different spot on the existing property. And I want to add a little bit to that as well. When it comes to the park and walk locations, we don't live in all of the communities, obviously, and that we service. So as community members to kind of help us identify some of those spaces, some of those businesses, 
that might be willing to allow us to use that park and walk location during arrival and dismissal. Um, if it's in the business area, they would probably appreciate some of that congestion lessening. So, you know, looking out for those locations, approaching them or whatever it might be to see if they would be willing to help us make it so that the traffic um, would not be as busy in that area and for our kids to be able to have the opportunity to walk and bike from a, a, a safe space. Thank you, everyone. So I am looking through here and I don't see anything else coming in, but um, please, if you have any questions, um, Oh, thank you, uh, Drew, for pasting the link to the presentation materials in the chat. So that's there um, again, and, and it will also be coming out to an email from you. If you have any questions, you know where to find us. You just go to the main page of the Safe Routes to School website and uh, go to the Contact Us uh, Outreach Coordinator, and you can find any of us and send us an email and we'll help you out. So we really appreciate um, your continued involvement with Safe Roads to School, and we want you to have a happy school vacation, uh, April vacation week next week, um, and please fill out our surveys and save the date for our award ceremony. Um, we are giving you back a few minutes of your day, so thanks again for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the week.